I think we're good. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this monthly webinar on the Southwest Drought Conditions and Resources. Uh, my name is Joel Lisenby. I'm the Regional Drought Information Coordinator for the Intermountain West and Southern Plains regions at the National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDIS. If you're not familiar with NIDIS, head over to drought.gov. Uh, these monthly briefings are produced in collaboration with USDA Southwest Climate Hub and NIDIS, and they're intended to provide just a quick update of drought conditions across the Southwest. These monthly 30-minute briefings began during the 2020 Southwest Drought Briefing as part of the Southwest Drought Learning Network's drought monitoring and reporting team and will continue as long as there's ex areas of extreme or exceptional drought across the southwestern United States. The Drought Learning Network links climate service providers with resource managers and resource managers with one another to increase landscape and community resilience in current and future drought. Before we jump into the content of the webinar, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land that each of us is on today is the ancestral land of tribal and indigenous cultures, and I pay my respects to their elders and chiefs, both past and present, and I welcome tribal and indigenous peoples who are joining this webinar today. Now a little bit of webinar logistics. For this webinar, everyone is muted. The webinar is being recorded, and webinar recordings will be available at two places. One, you could head over to the NIDIS YouTube channel or at drought.gov slash webinars. The format for today's webinar will be presentation by our two invited experts, followed by a time for questions. If you would like to ask a question, you can do so at any time by typing your question into the questions box, which in GoToWebinar is different from the chat box, uh, but look around, you can find it. It says questions on it. Um, at the end, questions will be moderated by Emily Elias. Emily is the director of the USDA Southwest Climate Hub. And now I'd like to present our two speakers for today. First is Peter Goebel. Peter is the service climatologist with the Colorado Climate Center at Colorado State University. His time is split between research and education and outreach activities. Peter's research is drought focused and is concentrated on the role of soil moisture in seasonal runoff, evaporative demand, and climate variability. Immediately following Peter's talk, we'll hear from Tanya Haig. Tanya is the social science coordinator with the National Drought Mitigation Center and works with ranchers on drought planning and monitoring. And she'll be sharing a new drought monitoring dashboard uh, for, uh, for ranchers. So with that, I'll now pass over to Peter. So um, give me just a sec, Peter. I'm gonna give you presenter permissions. And once you share your screen, you can just take it away. Sounds good. Uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay, and, and you're seeing, probably seeing the let's get started go to webinar thing right now. So um, I will go ahead and let's see what sharing. So we can, can see your, over. your presentation right now. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Okay, then I'll go ahead and get started. I was worried that it was on the wrong screen. Sounds like we're good. All right. Yeah, as Joel good. said, my name is Peter. I'm joining you from snowy northern Colorado today where we're uh, still playing catch up from a very uh, warm dry fall, but thankfully a little bit of uh, fresh powder today. Um, I'm going to give a very um, quick and broad overview of drought conditions in the uh, southwest U.S. and uh, then we'll hopefully have some time for questions at the end of this uh, whole uh, shebang. But uh, today's roadmap is we're going to start with just a current look at drought conditions as shown on the U.S. drought monitor. We're going to talk about some recent impactful weather and how we got to the point that we're at currently. And then we'll uh, give an overview of water supply conditions. There's a little bit of uh, seasonal weather outlook information at the end. If I have time, I may spend a minute or two on that, but it's really not the focus today. So it may uh, end up being altogether skipped, but we will take a look when we get there. So this is the most recent U.S. Drought Monitor map just released this morning showing the Intermountain West. And we see that all of the Intermountain West is in uh, ab abnormally dry or drought conditions. If we had Eastern New Mexico on here as well, we would see that Eastern New Mexico is also 100% at least abnormally dry, if not in some level of drought conditions. We also see that uh, you know, severe and extreme drought is speckled throughout the region with even a tidbit of exceptional drought down in um, New Mexico. Uh, a little bit about how we got here. 2020 and 2021 were both low um, runoff years, generally lower than normal snowpack, but also 
with warm, dry springs and warm summers uh, that have led to um, the runoff being somewhat inefficient or a little bit lower than we would have expected from just the uh, snowpack values that we've seen. Here is a look at how things have changed over approximately the last uh, six months on the U.S. Drought Monitor. 2021 was a pretty good monsoon season. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but we actually see with the better monsoon conditions and even some good October moisture up in uh, northern Utah and parts of northwest Colorado, that for most of the Intermountain West, the changes over the last six months have been good news. Uh, parts of eastern Colorado and New Mexico have remained dry and have actually uh, degraded. And maybe we don't want to get too excited about this because when you're already in extreme drought or exceptional drought, there's really not much of a place to go on the drought monitor but up. Um, you know, I'd, I'd also say that west of the Continental Divide, you know, in western Colorado, Utah, Arizona, the drought conditions that we're seeing are primarily long-term or owing to, um, you know, a water imbalance of greater than six months time scale. So this is a quick look at some of the recent weather that we've been experiencing. This uh, slide is just from the upper Colorado River Basin, looking at how temperatures uh, over the last uh, six full months have compared to other back half of calendar years in the upper Colorado River Basin. And we see it was the warmest on record. I don't think it was quite there with areas further to the south, but still a very um, warm summer, even albeit wet in some areas. And then, like I said, we've done decent with uh, the monsoon. This is the same thing, but looking instead at precipitation where we see we were about an inch and a half above normal for the second half of the calendar year, owing again to some really um, nice monsoonal moisture. Uh, this is an example of what that's looked like in terms of flash flood warnings. This is from um, the National Weather Service in Grand Junction, and it's basically a table showing flash flood warnings by um, year on the y-axis and by month on the x-axis. So you see that in an average year, the floods happen during that monsoon season in July, August, and you might get 10 apiece uh, between July and then August, but then 66 in July alone. This is not just because of how uh, rainy it was, but also because of rain occurring on burn scarred areas, which I know throughout a lot of the West is an issue. When you have burn scars, those soils are hydrophobic, so water doesn't sink in as easily as it's supposed to um, under normal soil conditions, leading to more uh, rapid runoff in what would normally be not too unusual of thunderstorm conditions. Okay, here's a look at you know what we um, experienced over fall of 2021. And we see that it was really a mix over the Southwest US. There were areas that were very dry, like the Rio Grande Valley in uh, Colorado, the upper Rio Grande, as well as uh, some of the urban corridor, the Denver area experienced its driest meteorological fall on record or September through November. Since then, uh, throughout much of the Southwest, there has been a turn for the better in terms of snowpack. This is a look at basin-wide snowpack numbers throughout the Southwest US um, as of just a couple days ago, as of January 24th. And we see that much of the uh, upper Colorado River Basin is um, looking at above normal snowpack, the lower Colorado River Basin. We see above normal snowpack in the northern half, but below normal in the southern half. It tends to be more the headwaters basins that uh, contribute higher runoff amounts in the spring. So it's good to see those uh, numbers on the positive side of, of normal. We had a really nice uh, snowy stretch around the second half of December. But this map is showing the percent of water year peak snowpack. So like I said, we're near or above normal in a lot of areas, but that translates to 50 to 60 in many cases percent of normal peak snowpack. And so my point here really is just that we have a lot of season left in front of, this, in front of us where these numbers can change one way or the other. All right, in terms of water supply and the stream flow situation, 
Like I mentioned, we did see uh, low flows in 2021, um, only 36% of average unregulated flows going into Lake Powell in 2021. This is one example graphic of the low flows that we've seen. The black line shows stream flow on the Colorado River at the Colorado Utah state line over the last two years. The um, shaded areas show kind of your uh, probability distribution by year. I, I guess what you need to know about that is that the green area is basically the normal range for flows. Um, yellows and browns are below, blues are above, and we see that we've been below normal uh, through the runoff peak season last year and then through some of the time since. And we've seen below normal flows in a lot of areas across the southwest over the last year. Uh, the greater reservoir supply situation continues to be um, somewhat grim, and that's uh, something that's not going to be changing anytime soon. So Lake Powell, this is a similar graphic to the last graphic showing uh, reservoir storage at Lake Powell throughout um, 2021, where we can see the declines. And then just at the start of 2022, I apologize, there's a couple days of missing data there, but the, um, again, shaded colored areas, the green area is supposed to be the normal range. And actually below the brown means that we're lower than any, um, any time really since the reservoir has filled for this time of year. And Lake Mead is, is low as well. So that's, that's certainly one of those long-term situations that's gonna take, it, it would take several great years in a row to really uh, re rebound from. Um, in terms of groundwater and soil moisture, we're still seeing a lot of areas across the Southwest of below normal groundwater. This is groundwater as measured by the GRACE satellite, which is looking at perturbations in basically uh, measurements of gravity that uh, can, can be traced back to different levels in the water table. Um, one interesting thing you see over a lot of high elevations in Utah and Colorado, it shows record low. I do expect that to improve once the snow melts you know, the, it doesn't sink into the groundwater until it, it melts. Um, and then this is a similar map. Again, uh, it's, it's gray space, but we're looking at root zone soil moisture or the top meter of soil moisture. And we see uh, east of the continental divide in New Mexico and Colorado, the consequences of the really hot summer and then record dry in some cases, but very dry fall that we have experienced where soil moisture is much below normal, if not uh, record low. All right, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of out of time here, but with the outlook, um, what we're looking at uh, in terms of uh, the next few months, in terms of outlook is gonna be largely based on uh, La Nina, as well as uh, whatever climate trends are in place. So we, we know as the climate warms that our probability of warmer than normal temperatures is up in all seasons, but then with La Nina, um, it's characteristic that we see the polar jet shifted further north, which is generally not good news for uh, the Southwest US, where we tend to see an increased tilt and probability towards below normal precipitation in spring. That said, uh, this is the latest Colorado Basin River Forecast Center um, forecast for the runoff season. And without getting too much into this, the green areas are areas where we're expecting near normal runoff. So right now, despite maybe a tilt towards below normal precipitation and dry antecedent conditions going into the snowpack year, the good snowpack we have in place has, has, um, has a thinking that the runoff year may look a little bit more normal this year than the last two. All right, uh, just a couple highlights and then we'll move on. You know, cold weather puts a lot of the drought impacts that we experience in the Southwest on, on hiatus but we're still dealing with considerable hydrologic, hydrological deficits, and that's gonna be the case going forward. Region-wide snowpack is above historical averages, so that's uh, great news, um, but we did enter the season with um, a low water table and low root zone soils. The spring will still have a large influence on what we see in terms of drought conditions, drought impacts, and overall runoff in the season to come but the overall reservoir storage situation in the Southwest US, you know, local conditions may vary if you're drawing, drawing on smaller reservoirs, but the general uh, Colorado River system um, is, is somewhat stressed right now. Um, and then this runoff here is likely to be better than the last two, but we aren't insured a big one. 
So with, with that, I'll um, go ahead and hand it over, but thanks again for um, having me with you today. Thanks for that, Peter. That's fantastic. Hey, we, Peter, while we're waiting for Tanya to pull her presentation up, there was a question about if you could share a link to the snowpack data in the chat box uh, so that people can go and look at that data on their own. I can and, do that. Uh, yep. Absolutely. Great. Thanks, Peter. And now I'm going to pass over to Tanya. Uh, we are we can see your presentation. Great. Right Thanks, now. Paul. Um, thanks, Peter. That was a really great update. Um, and thank you so much for having me today. I appreciate the opportunity to share this uh, ranch drought monitoring dashboard with you. Um, it's early in the season for ranch ranch drought uh, monitoring, but I hope you'll uh, find this tool to be useful and potentially share it and use it as we start going into the growing season. Um, so. The monitoring dashboard is really developed to be used specifically by ranchers and other rangeland managers. Um, it was built as part of our ranch drought planning website um, because we see that an important part of having a plan is knowing when to implement your plan. And during drought, ranchers have a number of decisions that need to be made. There are a few of them listed here. None of these are easy decisions, of course. Um, but knowing when drought is a concern and when decisions need to be made is particularly dif difficult. Um, as you all know, drought can be very difficult to detect, uh, but it can also be really difficult for rangeland managers to know what monitoring information uh, they should be using and how they should be using it in decision makers, so, or in decision making, sorry. So the ranchers who we've been working with let us know that it would be helpful if monitoring information could more directly alert them to potential problems and also help them answer the, the questions that they might have when they're making decisions. Um, so th to that end, the NDMC worked with the USDA Climate Hubs um, over the past year or so to organize and present a dashboard of drought monitoring information that um, would be the most relevant and usable in ranch decision making. The dashboard can be found at the URL on the top of the screen here. Um, and it's organized around, specifically around these five questions that ranchers tend to have when they're making decisions during drought. So first, obviously, what's my current drought situation? Um, but then second, a frequent question is how does this year compare to last year or another time frame? Um, third, very importantly for the ranchers, what can I expect for forage production this year? Um, fourth, this kind of question of could I still maybe get enough precipitation to change those forage production expectations? And then fifth, um, if I have to act, what are my options for drought management? So in this dashboard, if you jump on any of these questions, it jumps the user to information to specifically address that question. So first, what is my current drought situation? This is your typical monitoring data. It has a lot of information. Um, it becomes even more relevant this spring as we go into the growing season uh, because it really is focused on uh, forage production and so therefore is um, somewhat precipitation driven at this point. Um, the information is presented as layers in an interactive map. You can uh, see the current drought conditions. You can see drought and precipitation outlooks. Uh, you can see forage production and drought stress, stress measures. Um, impacts and condition reports, and you can turn off and on uh, base layers like counties or USDA regions. Um, the US drought monitor is set as the default display. You can turn that off or on. You can change the transparency to look at other layers uh, with it that might be useful. Um, you can zoom in and out. Um, I tried to zoom into the region a little bit here for you and just pulled up the um, precipitation uh, over the last 30 days, um, you can so you can kind of see along the right side here. Is there's buttons to open up a layer. You can and it shows you your options. It shows you more information there. Um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight that I think could be very useful is um, that you can directly um, access on the ground drought reports from uh, by link or by looking at the drought reports from coco Raz as well as the ndmc's um, condition monitoring tool and you can so you can you can see those reports directly in 
in the dashboard, which can be helpful. Um, you can also link directly to those resources from here for more information, and you can submit a condition monitoring report from this part of the dashboard. So um, this is um, really an on-the-ground monitoring tool that ranchers and others have found really important. It's a great way to have input, and we hope this makes it get, provides one more way to make it real easy for people to get there and to use these tools. So this is all under the what, what are, what's my current drought situation. Um, but there are other questions that ranchers have too. So the second question, how does this year compare to last year? Um, asking this question and looking back to, for example, like a year ago can help a rancher think about drought management decisions that they were taking in the past and then think about what might be might, what might need to be done now. So um, here you can see on the left is the current year. Uh, and then on the right is one year ago, according to the U.S. Drought Monitor. Uh, you can use the drop downs and the arrows to, you know, move back and forward a week or to choose different time periods altogether, just to help think through like what what was I doing in the past um, compared to what should I be doing this year. That third guiding question, um, what can I expect for forage production this year is um, obviously critical. It's kind of a, a centerpiece of the of the monitoring dashboard. The grass cast tool is highlighted specifically here. Um, we do highlight some additional tools. Some of them are state specific. Um, we're actually, uh, we've got a group of tool developers and ranchers coming together at the Society for Range Management uh, in a couple of weeks to talk about other tools that that ranchers would find really useful in this part of the, the dashboard. Um, so from here, we actually do have a grass cast overlay in the, in, in the um, current condition section, but from here you can click on the map to actually go to the full grass cast site, which has a lot of really helpful resources. Um, so this, is, this, this group of resources really helps for planning potential scenarios for the coming year based on, on what could happen. Um, this next piece, what's the likelihood of getting enough precipitation to change my forage production expectations? This is sort of the um, how long can we wait and see question. And to answer that question, um, we're trying to help ranchers think about when precipitation needs to occur on the ranch to produce forage. And then also what's the likelihood of getting that much precipitation um, in the time frame that when it's needed. And obviously the answers to the questions are going to be uh, based on local climatology and forage growth production curves. We've got a very simple um, little graph to try to show some regional variability right now. This is actually a, a piece that um, the NDMC and the USDA Climate Hubs are continuing to work on over this coming year to um, to kind of visualize the data differently and add some more data. So I'd encourage you to come back and check this out um, throughout the year. But overall, the main point of this section is to help ranchers know when it's time to stop waiting for rain and start taking action. And then finally, um, this question of what are my options for drought management? Um, obviously, this isn't really monitoring, um, but when we are monitoring and we find out we need to ask, act, um, we wanted to make it easy to, to get to this link of some resources to, to help know what to do. Um, so we link to a management library of, of resources, uh, technical resources by state. You can learn about other ranchers' drought management plans and other general guidance and recommendations here. So um, that kind of wraps it up for me. This is the list of guiding questions again. Um, I would absolutely love to hear from you for this region. Um, as far as what you think is important, what information is useful to ranchers in this area, you can contact me directly. There's a feedback button right on the site and you can contact us uh, that way as well. And um, here's my contact information. Um, the links again to the Managing Drought Risk on the Ranch site and the monitoring dashboard. So um, again, thanks for having me here today. I hope, I hope we can work together to make this tool even more useful, but I do hope you find it something that, that you can use in work. Thanks, Joel. Great. Thanks, Tanya. And thanks, Peter. Those are great updates. And we'll start with a question for Tanya. Can you tell us how you came up with the five questions that the dashboard addresses? 
Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, okay, so I, first of all, I did shop, stop sharing my screen, right? I still see your screen. Oh, okay. Well, I'll leave it for the, that's fine. Um, <laughs> go to webinar. Um, the questions that guide the dashboard um, were a result of, oh, thanks, Joel. Um, our work over the years with ranchers on put, actually putting together the Managing Drought Risk on the Ranch website. Um, and the kinds of things that they were looking for and the kinds of, um, of information that they were looking for, the kinds of questions that they had. And then um, when we started working on this about a year and a half ago, we pulled together some Extension and NRCS and uh, Climate Hub folks to, um, who, are, who are working directly with ranchers as well to help us think about um, you know, a discrete, a limited number of questions that that would be useful to help direct people to write the information they're looking for. Great, thanks. And I think those those questions are key. So thanks for putting that together. I think it'll be really helpful for a lot of people. I hope okay, so. Okay, a question now for Peter. Um, there were a few questions about data sources. And so I shared links to the snowpack data and also the Grace groundwater data and figure. Um, the qu next question is, any thoughts on large-scale artificial recharge basins to increase useful groundwater? Any question? Sorry, um, large-scale yeah. artificial resource basins? Oh, yeah, just basins for um, recharging water in, um, to increase useful groundwater. And that might not be, um, so it's a bit outside of your presentation, but I wonder if you have any thoughts about recharging the groundwater to use it uh, in the future. Hmm. That's not something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. So uh, definitely a little bit outside my wheelhouse. Um, I know, know I, some... I mean, sorry, what? Oh, I was gonna say there's some really interesting research going on about that in California. And so there's um, more to come, I would say, on groundwater basins um, and article recharge depending upon the uh, geography depending on where you're located and the, um, yeah I mean I'm, I, I'm gonna give kind of a non-answer since it's outside my wheelhouse and I apologize about that but you know could be a good idea in, in some areas but we have to consider that uh, we have the kind of the same amount of, of water either way so if you're you know say using snowpack in one area uh, when it runs off to recharge um, an underground aquifer, you're, you know, robbing that same amount of water from where it would naturally flow. So there will always be those kinds of considerations. Right. It's yeah. true. Um, okay, the next question. How much will the dry soil moisture conditions in the upper watersheds potentially affect the spring runoff, even with this above average snowpack that we hope we have? much more up my alley thanks for that one um <laughs> you know with the soil moisture that we had going into this um season it's not quite as bad as as last year in in most places but it's it's gonna take at least 110 likely 115 percent of average that answer is gonna vary um that answer is going to vary based on the basin that you're looking at. The wetter basins, you need you don't need to go as much over average um, to make up for the amount of uh, soil moisture that's missing. In the drier, on average basins, it, it may be a little bit more, but we're going to need to keep up the pace if we want, you know, 100% of normal runoff. Right. So uh, more to come on that. Then we'll just see how how the conditions play out in the next few months. One, one thing I can also say about that is I think that uh, after the last two years, um, people are a little bit shell-shocked about this idea of, well, the runoff's not going to produce like it's supposed to because it, it hasn't, the runoff numbers have been considerably lower than the snowpack numbers in both 2020 and, and 2021. One thing that we do have to keep in mind there is that those were both dry springs after April 1, 
And even though it might not be, uh, even though it might be after peak snowpack, and even though it might not even fall in the form of snow, the storms that we get through the end of April and and through May uh, also have a, you know, they're also impactful in terms of how much runoff we get. So um, it's not just the antecedent conditions that have led to that imbalance in the last two years. It's also the conditions that we've experienced post peak snowpack. Yeah, great. Thanks, Peter. Thank you so much, Peter Goble from the Colorado Climate Center and Tanya Haig from the National Drought Mitigation Center. And also thanks to uh, Joel Lizenby for helping me co-host these. Um, this concludes our Southwest Drought Briefing. Our next briefing will be February 22nd at 1 p.m. Mountain Time. Thanks very much.